So I've been involved with an archaeological group for uh, many years, for, uh, probably uh, 16, 17, maybe 18 years now, and um, gone to conferences over the years and then started digging with them uh, about five years ago. So we've done some digs in Jordan, done some digs, uh, what we believe is Sodom, uh, Tal El Hamam, we're going to see a little bit tonight, done some digs uh, then at what we believe is I. And, this, um, and, and so I'm going to kind of show this presentation. I've showed this in three cities in Africa and Ohio and Illinois, in Illinois, uh, a number of different churches and denominations. Uh, I've cut some, a lot of these slides out, but um, I'm going to go fast. So if you've got questions, you can ask me. But I get excited about the Bible, you know. <clears throat> and, you know, if, if this is the Word of God, and if this is the Word of God, it's true. Okay? So we get all these people and all these academic institutes saying it's not true. So this group that I'm working with has uh, been digging since the 60s, and the main thing that we were going to prove uh, uh, was um, that the city of Ai. The city of Ai has been identified as at Tel. It's just the name of a place there in the West Bank and uh, where Joshua conquered. And what happened is that uh, they would say um, when you, they excavated there, there's 12 geographical descriptions in the Bible, and it only meets about three of them. And so they just say the Bible's wrong. And the other nine, we just said, no, you got the wrong place. So um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Livingston started really with a group of uh, like-minded uh, minded men back in the late 60s. They formed uh, Associates for Biblical Research. They produced this magazine called The Bible and a Spade. And so we use the Bible and we go out and dig because we believe the Bible is inerrant. It's the word of God. Now, most biblical archaeologists actually do not believe that. And um, they may have the title biblical archaeologists. I guarantee you it's probably you know, 90% of them, maybe 95. They don't believe the Bible is inerrant. They think it's pretty good, but you know, it's got errors in it and people and blah, blah, blah. So uh, we just say, no, you, uh, you don't know our God. All right, so, um, well, how do we know? Well, um, you know, Noah's flood, things that we can find. We can go look at evidence. Tal el Hamam, that's over in Jordan. I've done three, three, been there three years and some digs over there. Uh, we think that's Sodom. You're going to see some more in there. Hatshepsut, we believe that was probably Moses' mother. Uh, that was the Pharaoh of the Egypt, Amenhotep II. Jericho, the first city that Joshua conquered. Um, <clears throat> coming in all right? Uh, can you hear me? Is it good? Okay. And um, Kerberth el Makater, that's I. That's the one that we've just finished, the 15th season. We're moving on to a new site, 15 years with an interruption of about eight, but actual 15 seasons of digging since 95, and we've proven that this is the city of A-I, or I. The, the A is silent in Hebrew, so it's actually I when you hear So you hear A-I. Yeah. That's what I grew up, you know, my mama taught me was A-I. Uh, David's palaces, they just found, well, of course, the palace, they just found another one you haven't heard a lot about in the Shephelah, in the foothills. Uh, the Temple Mount, excavations that around or nearby. The Dead Sea Scrolls, is probably one of the most amazing discoveries in the early 20th century that really eliminated about a thousand years. So if there was any questions on the text, you know, this put a big dent in those critics that were saying, well, we texts are off from 1000 AD. Now we got texts to go to 200 BC. So uh, very, very, very exciting. Um, so here's some recent stuff. I, I gave this presentation in the last couple of years. I haven't put the latest, latest stuff in it, but when I put it in, hey, they just found in September of 2015 uh, the tomb of the Maccabees. So it's extra biblical text, the Apocrypha, but uh, the Maccabees, the hammer, they called them uh, prior to uh, about 200 years before Christ, uh, they found his tomb. Um, it, here in uh, August of that year, uh, the gates of Gath. So you remember Gath and the big guy, right? G Goliath. Uh, found, we actually had been there years before, but they just found uh, then the actual uh, gate of, of uh, Goliath's uh, city there in Gath. Um, they just uh, found um, in June, they found this inscription, Eshbala ben Bada. It's a 3,000 year old piece of pottery, very, very clear. That's the name. That is King Saul's son, Ishbosheth. That's his name. And look, you see what they called him? You see the name in there? Baal. Baal. So Saul was naming him 
with the name, we know him as Ishbosheth, but in the thing there's Ish, Ishbael. Man, meaning, Ish means man of Baal. Hmm. Here they found uh, the Ekra. Uh, we know from Josephus' writings, this is right in, at the south end of Temple Mart, just north of what they found in the city of David. And we know from the writings, this is where the Greeks, Antiochus Pipides, had a fortress that c- uh, did everything from the Temple Mount. This has just been uncovered here just at the end of uh, 2015. So when you look, and this is what it looked like with, uh, I think I got a pointer here. This is what it looks like. Uh, maybe it doesn't work up there on TV. Uh, right there, and that would have been the Temple Mount. So that's the south right there, and that's where uh, this was just recently uncovered. And we, what, what would happen, and I don't have too much time to go in a lot of detail, but a, a, a lot of Jewish uh, Greeks, you know, Jews with some Greek backgrounds, some Greeks, but when the, the Greeks, after Alexander the Great died, and you had the Ptolemies, the Seleucids, what happened is they... They were controlling that era. Antiochus Epiphanes, we're reading about him in the book of Daniel. And here they would throw feces out with anybody going up to the Temple Mount and do all kinds of nasty stuff, you know, to the people as the Maccabees were coming in and taking back control. Um, we, we have a lot of those records. Uh, Josephus records a lot of that. This is that place where they would do that from to control who was going up to the Temple Mount. Here uh, is the uh, royal seal of Hezekiah. You can see uh, his name's actually in there, Second Kings. Again, we're seeing the actual seal that goes back to uh, his time. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were born before him. And there it is. Boom, 2,700 years of history pops right up. So here's a guy that supposedly didn't exist, right? And then here, here's his royal signet, his, uh, his bula. And... F- you know, fire and damage is a good thing because what happens, that's made of clay and when they come in and destroy and there's a fire, it hardens it and then it gets buried. And when it gets hardened and then we got people come along 2,700 years later, so they're out there digging and lo and behold, it's, you know, it was hardened and so now it was preserved and then we can dig it up and find it. Uh, here is, I was telling you about, they just found the first cemetery of the Philistines. Very first time, a graveyard of the Philistines. And this is in that Ashkelon over, it's further towards the coast from Agath. And you can see uh, the fellow there uh, as they're digging him up. Uh, they found a number of, uh, the, uh, of them, of the uh, skeletal remains there, right there in the Philistines that we read that Daniel was dealing with. So, what, so why did God pick Israel? Why did he choose that nation I mean, he destroyed, he came in, Adam and Eve, then we know about the flood, and then uh, it destroys and whole land changes, right? And then we come back through, and he ends up calling Abraham, and then he picks him this area right there, right? Why did, and he picks that area because why? Well, it wants to be the land bridge, be- <coughs> excuse me, it's the uh, land bridge between three continents, <coughs> between... Uh, uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa, right? So in, in that whole area, this is to be the people that he was uh, sending to be representing him, Yehovah, you know, the Elohim God, to the entire world. And everybody had to go through there. That was, you know, that was the, the I-75 and the, and the, you know, the 85 exchange. Thank you. Yeah, that that was, the, that was the point where everybody was coming to. They had to come through that area, and so they were going to come through Israel. Thank you. That's why he chose this area. Now, this was actually the promised land, and if you can see, you maybe can't, some of you folks probably can't back there, but it's really a big, a much larger area. In fact, you can see the Sea of Galilee there right there, and there's the Dead Sea. But then now you can also see, uh, you can't see the top, but that's Damascus there. So the Promised Land goes all the way up to the Euphrates, includes Damascus. In fact, Damascus was under control of Solomon when his, during his empire. Here's what it looks like today. And we have a bunch of people saying it should be a two-state state solution, and this West Bank area belongs to the Palestinians. No, that's the heart of Israel. That is the heart. That's Samaria. 
That was the area that Joshua gave to Ephraim. This is the area that we're digging at while we're here. I is right there, and then we're going to dig at Shiloh, and then Shechem, and then up, you know, up here is Megiddo, the valley of Armageddon. So, Bible archaeology. Do, do we need archaeology to prove the Bible? No. We don't. The Bible stands on its own. So, archaeology is just a tool that we use to evaluate events in ancient history. Okay, so it's just a tool. The issue is that people look at it and they come up with different interpretations. So, some that would be for what the Bible says, yep, it's exactly what the Bible says. And then others would come along and say, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. What we know is that Jesus rose from the dead. All right. And how do we know that? Well, we know that Paul writes it in 1 Corinthians, he's an eyewitness. The disciples, Matthew, you know, uh, we see Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, and John. We see these in letters, epistles, of eyewitnesses to the event that he rose from the dead. I didn't see him rise from the dead. I believe he did, but I'm not an eyewitness. I'm a person of faith. But I, look at, I look at evidence. They were eyewitnesses. Would you die for a lie? If he didn't rise from the dead, and they were eyewitnesses, and they were persecuted and killed for saying he rose from the dead, they wouldn't die. They wouldn't. They just say, uh, "Okay, well, sorry, we just made it up." But Jesus rose from the dead, so we know that. Why? Because they all died martyrs' deaths. They lost their jobs. They lost their families. They lost everything they had, and they lost their lives because they saw Jesus rise from the dead, and they knew it was true. They knew it. Right? And God allowed them to suffer for us. So we now today can know beyond a shadow of doubt that he rose from the dead. Would you die? So these guys here are getting killed from ISIS because they're Christians and ISIS is going to kill them. They're dying because they believe in faith that Jesus rose from the dead. But we have eyewitnesses that saw it. If we're put in that circumstance, I hope we would do the same thing they did, that we wouldn't uh, that we wouldn't deny our Lord and Master, right? Uh, in addition to all the eyewitness testimony, there's hundreds, there's thousands of prophecies in the Bible. Unlike any other religion in the world, that many of them have already been fulfilled. And we can go there and look at that. So much so that the critic says they has to be recording history after the events, like in the book of Daniel, right? Well, the problem is in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found copies of, of Daniel that, uh, that go into the second century B.C. It doesn't give a whole lot of time to for them to be written in the first century B.C. is what they would say. So here's uh, another one with the Taylor Prism. And this is about uh, Hezekiah, how uh, the king of Assyria has got them all bottled up. Hey, you recognize that guy, Eric? <laughs> That's my the youngest son, Jesse. This is in the Chicago Museum. They did a lot of work in the early 20th century. They've got a lot of stuff in King Tut and just a number of things there. But here we are. We find this prism. We find the, the Assyrian text. We find this, uh, the Kring Shennacherib. And we see here in the scriptures it says he's going to turn them back. Well, exactly what happens is he does go back. We know that the 185,000 are killed. And he goes back and his sons kill him. And we know from... This records here, that's exactly what happened. Those are their records. Not biblical, not, they're not friendly. They're, you know, people of the scriptures per se. They're Assyrian texts are saying this. So, archaeology. Well, what is it? A bunch of mumbo jumbo. Well, look at, you know, we got on, on the left column there, that just shows you the period, the, what they call them, early bronze, interme intermediate bronze, middle bronze, late bronze, uh, Iron Age, IA, okay. Uh, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine. So the time frames, you know, the Byzantines uh, after Christ, you know, with Constantine, and we see from three to really the 4th century through the 7th century, then the Roman period with Julius Caesar, really all the way up to the, the Constantine period, the Greek period, Iron Age all the way going back to the Iron Age um, 1, which is King Saul and David. So the period that we're digging in here is the Exodus period. And even the Jewish scholars, the Orthodox and all them believe in the, you know, the Bible, the Torah, uh, the books of Moses, but they don't believe, uh, the vast majority of Jews do not believe that there was even an Exodus. 
they, you know, the, the traditional teaching, uh, the academic teaching is uh, the nation of Israel became a nation somewhere around 600 B.C. Okay, that's what all the academic institutions teach. Well, it's not true. The Bible tells me. They called Abraham. He was a father of many nations. He was a father, and his grandson was Jacob, and he became Israel. All right, that's what we're looking. So we're looking for evidence and showing that that is the case. And I think my pointer's dying here. But uh, as we come down, uh, so that period from Joseph, then the Exodus around 1446, uh, and then we go into the conquest by Joshua, and that's where we're focusing on, Jericho, and then I, and then Hatzor, but the whole campaign through Canaan. That was promised to Abraham's offspring for after 400 years, if you recall, right? And that's what we've been doing. And then the book of Judges, and then the, the starts into the king period. Now, here's what's kind of cool. So guess what they find? This Merneptah in Egypt. This is the son of Ramses II. And Ramses II lived, uh, he was an old timer. He lived to be, he was, uh, you'll see in the Charlton Heston movie as the pharaoh of the, uh, uh, the Egyptian pharaoh of the Exodus. That's the liberal view. It's 200 years off. It's actually a minute up. It's 200 years before in the 18th dynasty. But um, why? Because there's at least three texts that point to that date in the text. Kings and Galatians and other, uh, and Chronicles. So when we look at it, but here's the Merneptah tablet. It's in this period here, late bronze two, and somewhere around 1205 B.C., and here's what it's got on there, this description. Israel, basically it says is Israel's laid waste and their seed is no more. We wiped them off. There's nothing left of them. You know, it's like, a, I don't know what the latest, a WWF or whatever. You know, they smacked down. They got rid of them. That's what this, you know, it's a bunch of trash talk is what they're doing. Uh, they, they weren't. They were basically licking their wounds from... Uh, a couple hundred years before when uh, God brought judgment on them, right? So the, they're just having a difficult time. So that's where that's at on that tablet, right, on that stone tablet right there is in that location that says that. In the hieroglyphics there, Israel is laid waste. There's seed and grain. It's gone. Now here is this called the Berlin Stella. And this is in this period here. So it's even older and it's in the uh, 13, some put it around 1350 B.C. Now, now remember, they're all saying there's no Israel. They don't even exist until for another 700 years. This is, the, the names are Ashkelon, the first one, Canaan, and then guess the third one's kind of destroyed, right? But it says Israel. Well, the argument has been, uh, well, first of all, it was discovered in the 1913 or so. Uh, and then it went into Berlin, and it stayed there. And then some scholars, by the way, they just recently found some new... They're, they're finding stuff because there's so much stuff in the museums that have never been even looked at. They've been dug up 100 years ago, and they, haven't even, they don't even have enough scholars to go through all the material. So to me, it's very exciting because they're still finding discoveries. This one was, you know, 100 years ago, it stood there in 2010, a group of scholars, some German scholars started looking at it. They came up with, yeah, that's, nobody argues that it says Ashkelon, this, the city we just looked at, with a graveyard. Uh, Canaan, you know, we know. They all argue about Israel, because it can't be Israel, because there is no Israel. It cannot be Israel. So they would say, it's too damaged, and you can't say that. And about three years ago, they modern technology, they started doing 3D imaging and scanning and all that, and then all the scholars said, oh, it says Israel. <laughs> oh, well, it can't be in Israel. They didn't exist. Of course they existed. This, this tells me they existed, right? Uh, so guess what the academia is saying now? <clears throat> well, that must be a group of people that call themselves Israel, but not the real Israels, not the ones we call today. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. I kind of grew up that, you know, if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, uh, you know, smells like a duck, floats like a duck, it's a duck. All right. It's Israel. Come on now, folks. Uh, so 
when you, and I'm not going to go through this text just because of time, but if you get a chance, you go read John 5. And, of course, what happens is, uh, and here he's, John, uh, John, Jesus raises, uh, heals the man at the pool of Bethsaida. Okay. And it goes through on here. And Jesus is always kind of, you know, pulling people's chains, right? Because uh, they get they on his case because he's healing on the Sabbath. And it says the law says you can't heal on the Sabbath. Well, the law is the Mishnah, the oral law. You can go through the Torah, I guarantee you, you will never find that in there. It's not in there. But so, because Jesus is never going to violate his fault, he's never going to violate the word, right? Uh, but they made, they added to it. My, my epitaph, my life verse is Deuteronomy 4 2. Don't add a word, take away a word, just do what I told you to do. That's what God tells Moses. Just do what I told you to do. Be obedient, circumcise your heart, do what I told you to do. And. So I, Jenny and Jess, they all know that's on my tombstone. I've been talking about it for years and years. Uh, when I die, that's what I want on my tombstone. And that's my life verse. Read the word, all 66 books. Don't add a word, take away a word. If your traditions conflict with it, get rid of them. And do what he says. Well, these guys had this, you can't heal on the Sabbath. You guys up there, he's taking up his mat. He's walking, he's doing work. And today in Israel, when you go there, and on the Shabbat on Saturday, you, they, they have Shabbat elevators. You can't push an elevator button if you're Orthodox Jew because you're doing work. You're kindling a fire. And says, what? <laughs> Give me a break. That's what they go. They can't even drive a car. The Orthodox one because of pistons, right? And they, they're firing. You do, you're generating a fire. You're violating the law. So they have Shabbat elevators that automatically stop on every floor on Saturday. All they do is every, just they go all the way to the top, they come all the way back down, you know, stop at every floor on the way. So if you're an Orthodox Jew, you can get in the elevator, stop at every floor. Now, you know, if you live in a 100 floor, you, you might be a long way to get back up, but uh, that's, you know, that's what they teach. Jesus is just slapping him in the face. He heals this guy, says, get up, pick your, walk, your mat up and go on. And then he gets to this long discussion. And then at the end of this discussion, he says, it's not, uh, he, he, he first talks about his is the witness, his father's a witness, his works are the witnesses, John the Baptist is my witness, and he says, and Moses is my witness. And he says, it's not I who accuse you before the father, Moses accuses you in whom you put your hopes. If you really believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he said, how will you believe what I said? This is what Jesus says. You have to believe what Moses said. He quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book. Here's the pool of Bethsaida. For a long time, uh, uh, critics again used to say, oh, there's no five porticos, just like it says in John. And in archaeology, guess what we found? Oh, five porticos, going back to the Roman period. Why? Because in history what happens is after the Romans, then came the Alamooks, you know, the, 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 came the Crusaders first, I mean, sorry, came the uh, uh, Byzantines, and then after the Byzantines came the Alamooks, and then, you know, about 1,000 A.D. came the uh, Crusaders, and they all did their own thing here, constructions and building over sacred places and stuff, and, and so they all changed it. But as you get back down and you look in the first century at the time of Christ, guess what we found? Five porticos, just like it says in the Gospel of John. Hmm, imagine that. Uh, and that's what, it, that's what it, the recreation would look like. And that's what Jesus, do you believe what Moses says? That's, Jesus says you have to believe what he says if you're going to believe in him. You got the right Jesus? So what happens uh, here? Well, that's the Valley of Megiddo. So this area in between there from um, this, where it's pointing to, uh, Napoleon was there and said you could put all the armies in the world there. We know from Revelation is that in Ezekiel, it's going to be where the last battle takes place. It's a massive area. It's beautiful when you're there. Vast, the agriculture is incredible. The Israelis are just they're doing marvels with the place. A place that nobody wanted to live there 150 years ago. You don't know they got a place that's just incredible, incredible. Um, so who's fought over this? Well, 4,000, if you control this area, you control it, the whole area from the Mediterranean all the way inland. And the King's Highway is over here, and the, the highlands are through here. And that's the lowest place on earth, is the Dead Sea, that you can breathe there. All right, the dead, 1,300 feet below sea level. So 
People have fought to control that, to control the land bridge between Asia, Africa, and Europe for 4,000 years. The Egyptians, the Hittites, the Phoenicians, the Canaanites, Israelites, Syrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Turks, you know, the French, the British. I don't know, maybe the Georgians will go there. I don't know, but you know, <laughs> you know, everybody has fought to control that area. And the, why? Because of its strategic importance. God had a plan. This is what a 3D image of it looks like. And you can see the little hand, they call it often a hand up there, uh, where it comes in, in that whole valley. Actually, it's below sea level, a lot of it is. Sea of Galilee is actually below sea level. Not pe- people are surprised when I tell them that. Um, and it flows down into the Dead Sea, which doesn't go anywhere. And you can see the highlands up there through that. But that's the, uh, um, the Valley of Megiddo. Here's a little closer picture. Now, if you're looking at it, there's Megiddo, the actual fortress, an ancient fortress has been many levels. And we go excavate it. And there's Beth Cheyenne. There's this, on the end there, as you go into the Jordan Valley, uh, there's a famous Roman rules. 300,000 people come there a year. Tourists go through there just to see this place. And then there's Nazareth. Now, who was at Nazareth? Well, of course, Jesus was, right? So, now, uh, actually, it was just a few, probably three years ago, I, I just had this revelation. I never, never thought about it. I'm sitting there. I was driving around. I, I got a hotel there, and I'm looking over this valley. I think there's a picture of it. Yeah. I'm looking, and there's this valley from the hotel I'm in. That's the Valley of Megiddo. That's Jesus' view. The battle, the place that people have fought over for 4,000 years to control the world And here's Jesus being raised there, and he's going to be the final victor in the Valley of Armageddon. And he's right at, looking right down at it this whole time. He says, wow. I said, thank you, Lord. I never even thought of that. It's so cool. The King of kings and Lord of lords is raised the first time as a sacrifice. He's coming back the second time as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's He's not coming back to bring a lamb. He's coming back with a sword. He coming back with a rod of iron. You use rod of iron to what? Crush heads. Uh, we, we're going to come back with him and watch. We'll be the armies that come back, but he's gonna, if we want to do anything, we're just going to be eyewitnesses. He's so powerful. He's so powerful. Here's what Beth Cheyenne looks like today. And you can see the Roman columns. There, was, there were hot air, um, the saunas and cold saunas, and there was a stadium over here, and... This would have been all covered. It would have been shopping areas. And, you know, you, they had a Starbucks over here. <laughs> it, it was incredible. You know, now, see that hill behind there? Well, that was like about 2,000 years of history. And at one time, when you read the scriptures where Saul, King Saul and Jonathan, their bodies were put up there when they died in Gilboa. It was right there. What they've done is they've excavated down, I think, about 17 you know, civilizations. Because, you know, you go in, you fight, you take over a place, you level up, just start building up again, right? Go in, the next group comes in, build it back up. About 17 civilizations there. Archaeology in itself is a destructive process, right? So they leave some of this area, and I didn't show all these pictures, and I don't have enough time, but, the, you know, it's destructive in nature because you're ripping stuff out of the ground. But that's how you learn, so you be very careful on how you document it. Oh, actually, this is a picture from the top. And you can see some of the areas that haven't been excavated, and they're leaving it you know, down here in this area right here. You can see the Cardo, where they would have done the shopping. You can see the big uh, amphitheater back there. And uh, it's just you know, incredible. 300,000 people go there. Uh, here's again the view. Here's Qumran, down in that south end, right by the Dead Sea, where they found the scrolls. Uh, I don't know who that guy is. Uh, that's the Temple Mount area. You can see the Dome of the Rock. That's where the temple was at. And then in the background, you see that uh, steeple there. That's the uh, Mount of Olives. Some people believe that's where Christ ascended. And then there's another place where others say he ascended there. And then, and then for fifty nine ninety nine, I'll show you where he really ascended from. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it, it, people, we don't know where he was. This is from the Mount of Olives. That's the Kidron Valley. And the Garden of Gethsemane is right over here. (laughs) 
can't see it. Uh, this is the city of David right below there in this area they just discovered the last eight years. And, um, and this runs all the way down to the Hinnan Valley, uh, what was, became known as hell because that's where they burned everything down there. And so we get that root word from it. it when it goes back up on the other side, it's called the Typhonian Valley. So when you look at it, the valley looks like this. Does that look familiar? Yeah, Shin. Live long and prosper. So you see that in Star Trek all the time, right? Well, this is also the name for God. When you see the high priestly prayer in Numbers chapter 6, this is what they're putting on the people. They would say the prayer, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, and may the Lord set face shine upon you. As you go through that, they would do this. Why? Because that's the symbol, that's the symbol for God. So it would be like this. If I did that, you say, oh, okay. Well, that was the name for God. Leonard Nimoy was a Jew. And they were looking for some kind of symbol to put on the old Star Trek in the 60s and for the Vulcan. And they said, uh, hey, what about this? He says, I, I you know, learned this when I was in the synagogues. Why don't we use that? Now, here it is, a program that's anti-Christian, anti-Bible. And here's the name of God being proclaimed to it. Does God have a sense of humor or what? This is the, uh, what it looks like today with the, the gates in the city, the Dome of the Rock, uh, the, the Armenian quarter down here, the Christian quarter, the Holy Sepulchre, the Muslim, and then the Jewish quarter. I don't have time to go to show you a lot. It's amazing what the Jews have done. That's the Holy Sepulchre. Up here is Gordon's Calvary. Protestants love that, uh, but we know that from Scripture it says it was a new tomb cut out. Um, and we know now this tomb goes back to the first period, to the first temple period. Nobody's arguing that in, anymore, but it's a beautiful place to go. It's a beautiful place to worship because there's a garden there, and there's a rock formation that looks like a skull and all this and that. Gordon, uh, a famous Victorian um, military officer, was there, and he's just named after him. He did a, a lot of research around there at this time. They just actually excavated... Uh, if I had time to update this, I would have put, they just went and did archaeology, and I think ABR was involved in some of this too, the group I'm with, and I'll talk to them when I get here in June, when I get back, but uh, they just uncovered the burial place of Christ. So it's kind of like a tomb around a tomb and a tomb when you get in there. You, when you go in, all you see is religious, you know, um, symbols and from different periods, and Catholics, they all fight, by the way. Armenians and all that, they all have these fights over who's going to control what there. Um, the Eastern Orthodox, the Armenians, and the Coptics, and uh, the Catholics. Uh, the archaeology has demonstrated, yes, uh, it, there's the history is consistent with a tomb that goes back to that first century. Just, just being published, some of that information here just right now. Here's what it would look like in Herod's time, in the first century. And you can see, because a lot of people go there now, and they go back and they say, well, it's inside the, the wall. And I said, well, because they don't know that in the time of Christ, it was outside the wall, the Holy Sepulchre. Okay? So, whoops, went the wrong way. And that's Gordon's Calvary, what we call today. Here's uh, the view from the southeast corner. That would be the eastern gate. And then um, Solomon's portico, you can see the temple. And going into the temple, you always go into the west. So there's a reason for that, right? Because Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, when they sinned and they were kicked out of the garden, which way? East. So when you're going away from God, the symbol is you're going east. When you're going to God, you're going west. You go from the sacrifice, from the altar, into the holy place, into the holy of holies. You're going west. Burt Lancaster, and I uh, can't remember her name, and won a bunch of Academy Awards, uh, East of Eden. Uh, famous scene with them kissing on the beach, right? And the waves coming up. You see that, I, that iconic picture, a little clip. Uh, Frank Sinatra and Bergnine and all those guys were in it. They named it East of Eden. Because why? Well, people back then knew exactly what they were saying. Going away from God. Michael W. Smith goes, go west, young man, go west. You hear that saying, go west, young man, go west. Going west is going to God. That's the symbolism. Keep that in your mind because I'm going to show you something that's going to blow your socks off. So, <sighs> Here's the, uh, the Holy of Holies. 
So if you look uh, in the center, that, well, you see around the outside, it, circular, is the Dome of the Rock where it stands today. And you can see, and then throughout time with the Crusades and all these periods, there's been destructions and changes and all this to the Temple Mount area. But this, by measurements, uh, mostly from Rick, Dr. Rick Beyer, uh, and, and I've had a chance to be with Rick Beyer a number of times to talk to him. He's considered the world's foremost expert on the Temple Mount. And look right in the center there, in the Holy of Holies. This is where that massive curtain would have been. See it there? This is where the temple walls would have been. See that spot right there? Guess what? It's a cut right into the bedrock, the perfect size for the Ark of the Covenant. And right there it is. You see it? Right there. Still there. I don't know. It gives me goosebumps every time I see it. So here's I, Jericho, here's the valley, Jerusalem, Salem, the time of Joshua, Kerbeth el Makata, or I, Tal Haman, which we believe is Sodom. You can see it over to the right. Again, relations to Judah. Uh, Mount Gerizim, Ebal, where the children came up to. We're going to be digging just north of there from I, Kerbeth el Makata, at Shiloh. And the Ark of the Covenant was uh, the tabernacle in the Ark of the Covenant there was 369 years. Uh, the, did some digs in the 80s, and I said, ah, no evidence that uh, there was an exodus of people were there. And we said, it was there 369 years. There's evidence. We just got to go find it. So we gotta, we're going to go out there and find it this year. We're going to do our first season there. And um, very, very excited about it. Uh, Kerbeth el Makater, this is what we do there. You can see the modern highway that goes through there. This is all Palestinian homes. This is in the West Bank. Uh, <coughs> This is us climbing up in the morning. That's actually a Jewish kibbutz over uh, in that area. They, it's very dangerous for them. They had a little school girl got killed by the Palestinians when, uh, one time. Um, they, you, know, they got, you have to live with security and fences and people and guards, and you, know, you just walk around like you're in the wild, wild west. You've got to wear automatic machine guns and, and, you know, to protect yourself. Now, the, the Arabs, the Palestinians don't have to, but they do. And it's their land. God gave it to them. The United Nations says they don't own it. Everybody's fighting, uh, Obama and everybody. You can just show here, uh, what I'm showing you is that in a biz there was a Byzantine church that was built up on the top. We don't know why they built it. We've excavated it, you know, again, fifth, you know, 500. Why did they build it? Well, did they build it because of Abraham? Or did they build it because of Joshua? And then Hasmonean periods. Here's the wall, the gate, I'm sorry, the gate to the north. You can see that, Hasmonean wall. And then it goes back to the time of Joshua. This is the wall that we're finding at the time of Joshua. Eugene Merrill from Dallas Theological Seminary spent, had some opportunities. He's done Bible translations for a number of Bibles, uh, versions, and, um, uh, and over 200 uh, 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 scholarly uh, publications. Um, this is the Byzantine church on the top. We find some of those pillars that would be columns for this church, actually down in the Palestinian homes. You know, they just repurpose them. Why not? You know, if you've got a perfectly good column, stone column, why not just reuse it? History, that's what happens. Uh, some, if I had time, I'll tell you about uh, uh, Ramses, the city. And it took them 70 years to figure out that actually the city, whole city had been moved. Uh, but they finally know that now. Um, here's what it would look like at the time. It's a three-asp uh, Byzantine church. That's Nathan. Uh, he's hard work. You know, he's taking a little lunch break. Uh, he was our scorpion hunter. He actually did find some scorpions, so... His, uh, uh, his grandpa and grandma, and then they, were, they, were, they were good diggers. But. All right, this is I. So that you can see Jerusalem in the background south. Kerbeth el Makater's I. You see the modern highway there. And you can see, and when you read Joshua 7, you see this uh, large valley to the west, and that's the Wadi Shebang. And this is where, you know, the first time it didn't work because why? They didn't go to God and ask, right? Achan took something he wasn't supposed to. And at Jericho, says, don't take it. And now, by the way, when it came to I, he says, hey, you can take it. You know, you can go in there and take the spoils. But at Jericho, you do not. Aiken was, oh, it looks pretty good. I think I'll take some of that, some of that gold, some of this stuff. It, your sins, my sins, aren't done only that affect me. They affect the whole community. 36 people lost their lives in the first try. That were families, you know, wives, mothers, fathers of those guys that first went up there and got killed, and then they came back and said, oh, no, we're in trouble. If we lost this battle, everybody's going to hear about it. We're doomed. And so they drew lots, and they found it was Achan, and then they found the stuff, and he acknowledged, right? Here's the ambush. So the second, 
The second go around was Joshua camped there between the wadi, uh, the, with the wadi gag right here. So this is I. There's another wadi, and that goes all the way down, boom, 800 you know, feet below sea level all the way down towards Jericho. So you're up about 2,800 feet above sea level right now. Here's uh, I'm digging at this square here. You can see the lines and metrics. The gate that we found is just behind me, a little bit to the left. These are Palestinian homes. And up here was Joshua's camp. The wadi was right behind me. That was his post. I won't go into other eight records we found with the Egyptians in Salem or Jerusalem that say, hey, we were having problems with these Shechemites before Joshua gets there. And so this was like the DMZ, North Korea, South Korea, this area right here. These are some of the implements that we found, the arrowheads and sling stones. We found a massive destruction layer, burnt layer. Uh, here's a Palestinian over here taking every day he brought a sheep out. You can see the coverings we have, forest and sillside. So I, this one I actually took last year. I had somebody take. You see the, the pa same Palestinian guy. Every day he came out on his donkey. He had the sheep. He had the bells on him. He'd be out there running around. And then, uh, so he'd come out, be smoking a cigarette, uh, riding his donkey, the bells, and he'd be texting on his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> every, every year he's doing the same thing uh, but the interesting thing on this was the, the land, uh, one of his ewes had, uh, was, had a lamb when we were there and he brought because it's so hot there even, in, you know, even though you're high up it's hot so he brought him up underneath the tent and he took um, as it was being bored just to, you know, so it can get out of the sun and then it had a second lamb Turn over, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 13. And while you're turning to chapter 13, I'm just going to read to you a little bit about chapter 12, because this is the area of Ai. It's east of Bethel. And in chapter 12, as you're turning to 13, I'm going to talk a little bit about 12. He calls God, Jehovah calls Abraham out of Ur of Chaldees, and he tells him go down to Shechem, Genesis 12, 6, in the land as far as uh, by the Oak of Moray, now the Canaanites were there, and he appears to them, and he says, and he makes an altar there. And then he says, then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east, and he built an altar to the Lord. So here he is. When he first comes into the land from Shechem, he comes right here. He's right here. His sheep were all over there. Lots were all over there. They're all having lambs in that area. They're all growing. God's, you know, he's got the, he's got the best... Uh, uh, stock market rate you could ever think of. I mean, you know, he's just cheaper just coming, you know, they're just, God blessed them, right? That's what scripture says. And so, you know, his stock market plan was great. Goes down to Negev, Hebrew, uh, down to Hebron, they come back up, and then you get to chapter 13. Chapter 13, it says what? And Abraham, they went up, and they journeyed back to Bethel in chapter 3, and this is again between Bethel and I. It's right here. And then what happens? Well, Lot and, and, you know, had they flocks and herds, and the land could not sustain both of them. And so there was strife between them. And so then in verse 9, or verse 8, he says, Hey, Abraham says to his nephew, You pick. Where do you want? You want to go left? I'll go right. You want to go, you know, where you want to go? And so this is what the choice that he makes. In verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the valley of the Jordan that it was well watered. Everywhere, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the gardens of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as far as you go to Zor. Oh, one thing I didn't talk about is that we've also finding at this location, it's the first symptom, just as anything, there's different... Um, destruction layers in different periods. We're finding Hesmonia and some Greek. And Rome. Well, we find a first century Jewish village. Now, when you go to John, the Gospel of John, what you find is that, uh, that in John chapter 11, after Jesus raises Lazarus, he says he goes to a place called Ephraim prior he goes back before the Passover. Well, this is that area. We don't, I can't say that this city, we, we first found a village, I mean, a few houses, then we started finding a very large one. Now, we're done digging there, but it was clearly a large first century Jewish uh, city here. N Ephraim's never been found. And this is right on that area. And we're saying, hmm, were they there? 
I don't know. I look at the connection with Abraham, with Lot. I look through Joshua coming there and conquering later on. I look at, you know, I said, well, maybe he was. Here's uh, some of the first century, co- or the coins that we found that necessary first century. I actually have those two coins right here. I, we found all these coins, on the ones in red, and I got a Pontius Pilate coin that was minted in 29. You're welcome to come up and see it. I got a Herod Agrippa. Remember James? Uh, I've got an oil lamp from the first century, very fragile. You can come and look at it, and then a, a tear bottle, a tear catcher. And it's uh, very popular. And then I'll talk to you if you come up here. Here's the area I was talking about with uh, Makater is I. There's Jericho and Jerusalem. And that's uh, uh, Bethel. This is the ascent. And it's a sharp, sharp scent. It goes way up very sharply. And there's the ascent, typical scent that went to Jerusalem from Jericho. And that's Jesus would have used that many times. They used it for thousands of years. It took you about a day to make that ascent. That's the Patriots' way through the mountains uh, through the, as you go along that. There's modern roads that go through it now. This is from I, looking south to Jerusalem, and that's the Mount of Olives right there. You, you would have had signal. This was a northern fortress for it. This is where they would communicate and say, hey, we're under attack. Send some troops, right? Like the Lord of the Rings when they're lighting the fire, right? This is how they would have communicated with each other. Uh, this is looking north, and you can see Jericho there. You can see the valley, the hill country, uh, I. Here's at I when you're looking east. So Genesis 13. This is what Lot would have seen. He would have been looking down from 2,800 feet above sea level to you know, uh, about 1,000 feet below sea level. And it's all green. It's all banana trees down there. Very, very hot in the summer. And right there, we found a massive city going back to the time of Abraham. 80 million muck br- mud bricks for the walls, uh, walls that are 12 feet thick, feet, uh, 12 feet thick. Jesse's dug over there with me. I've dug there a number, couple of seasons, and we believe that's Sodom. Why? Because Genesis 13. Now, my maps always showed it down in the south end of the Dead Sea, okay? But then when we started looking at records, we found older records showed it on the north end. And then when I go to this record, it says, Lot looked east, and it says what? It was like, it well-watered, and this was before destroyed God, Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Ooh, eastward, going the wrong way. He made the wrong choice. Now, it's symbolic here. Right? If you go, if you're gonna, you know, when you leave here, you might have to actually drive east, right? So you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you might not be, but uh, <laughs> you, you will be okay. This is symbolic. It's saying is that Lot made the wrong choice. He went east. Right. And Abraham settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot settled in the cities in the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against Jehovah. What choices do we make? You know, are we going west or are we going east? Where are we at? Where are you at? Where am I at? We, we constantly have to be challenging stuff. We constantly have to let the Holy Spirit be working us, convicting us to stay in the word, to be grounded, to understand, to know which direction we're going. Right? So this is the picture. If you're looking up, here's that kikar. Kikar, uh, the valley of the Jordan. Hebrew words kikar just means circular. Circular disc, like a bread. Like that's the term they use for bread. That's the valley of the Jordan, the Kikar. Here's Abraham and Lot. They're, they caught the, the, the night express train from down from Ur. They come down. They use the bus stop here at I. And then we call that Kerber Thelma Cotter. We look at Genesis 13. He looks across east. He says, oh, man, those big city lights down there. That's the biggest city around. And look how green everything is down there. I am going there. So he goes down to Tal el Now, if you're over there, Tal el you're looking west. This is what, that's Jericho. The, the ancient ruins are actually kind of up in the middle there. Here's what it looks like. Jericho, Sodom, Jerusalem. We're going to be digging at Shiloh. Remember the curse, blessings and curses? That's Ebal and Gerizim right there. That's how you got up there. That's how you get to Jerusalem. That's the King's Highway over there on the right. That's that's how the children of Israel went in Joshua. When it nice, there's a nice sloping, a lot easier valley or access there. That's Sodom right there. 
TSU been working. You see that foundation, the rock one down there? You see the two big towers and the two small towers? It's a four, it's a four gate system where well, there's a large tower right there. You see it down there in the bottom? You see it right there? So that's what we're, we're uncovering. So here's the small tower. And there's the gateway to get in there. There's Jesse digging there. These are, this is from 1000 BC, this time of David. Solomon probably, this is probably his 12th district when he talks about it. These were, we found, these are like everywhere, these silos where they put grain in. They built them on the hillside. Okay, there it goes. And that's, what, that's a mosque right there in the bottom. You see the bus. We, we store a lot of our equipment. Abu uh, Ahmed, we, we have a good working relationship with him. These are Jordanians, or Palestinians and Jordanians. Um, there's tank torrents up there at the top, but uh, there was a second level. Massive, massive area. That's how the, most camels prefer Toyotas when, they, when they're riding. <laughs> and the Honda Civics were a little bit too tight for them. This is a picture from Mount Nebo. So when Moses was up there and he dies, this is what he's looking at. I, I have this in high definition so he can blow it up in excruciating detail in uh, pictures. But it, it's, uh, you, you get a chance to see the Dead Sea in that area. Now, I'm not, we don't have time. We're running out of time. But I just want to say, if you went to Numbers 2 and you read that, you'd see a whole bunch of numbers on, hey, if you're going west of God, you're going to be with God. You want to be, you go camp with God, right? So remember the children of Israel camping with him in the wilderness, right? Well, this is how they camped. And it says, you know, Reuben t- to the south. And then next to him, it says Simeon. And then it says next to him is Gad. And then over Dan uh, here. And then he goes to camps to the north. And then Natali and then Asher. And then Judah to the east. And then Issachar, Zebulun, and then to the north was Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. In the center, it says Levi. I don't have time to read it. You can go read it. It goes through all those numbers. And she said, so what? Well, that's why, so what? Look at it. What is that? What is that? It's a cross. So if you're Moses and you're standing up there and you're looking down and you're seeing this, in the heart is the tabernacle with the pillar of fire, the word of God, the ten words, the ten commandments in the Ark of the Covenant in the center with these guys all camped around. It's pointing to Jesus Christ the whole time. Here's what it looked like when he was there. He would have seen, looked down, seen all these tents. He's just getting ready to go home with the Lord. There's the Jordan River going all the way up to the Galilee. And there's the Dead Sea. There's Jerusalem going west. There's Sodom, the wrong direction, going east. Going across in baptism into the promised land. Wow, isn't that incredible? You'll never read it the same, will you? See, we, we don't know it. The, the Jews, when I'm there, they don't even know anything about it. They just assume burn the New Testament, and we just assume forget the Old Testament. I say 66 books. Learn them. Read them. Study them. Ah, there's so much design in there. Here's a, uh, Jesse, here's some of the stuff that we got there. You can see the Bedouins behind us there in the tents. The sheep, whoo, the sheep, they were stinky. They were, they were bringing their sheep in and out every, you know, all day. Macarius, where John the Baptist was uh, beheaded uh, by uh, the Herod, by the Antipas right there. The city of Jerusalem, what it looked like in the first century. Uh, real quickly, that's Caiaphas. They found the tomb, or the, the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. They built. Uh, they found the area. This is the retaining wall for the palace of David. It's still massive constructions going on there. Uh, the, it's one of the most pop, one of the most visited places in the world right now. Is this area the city of David? It runs all the way down to the pool of Siloam. So there's the city of David. There's where the high priest was at. That's a thousand BC. That that's uh, two thousand years ago uh, at the time of Christ up there by Caiaphas and where Jesus was put in. Uh, that's his ossuary, the bone box. It has his name on it. They found that. This is the square up there at the top where his place. And look at the top. What do you see there? You see a rooster up there, right? Remember? And there's Peter denying the Lord. Yeah. Are we denying the Lord? No, we want to be faithful, right? Know where we're at. Make sure you're going west. Don't deny the Lord. Be faithful. 
You can see the dome of the rock. Or that would have been the temple at the time of uh, Jesus. And he's down underneath. I don't know if I got a picture. Oh, I do. You can read this in the Psalms and when he's put it down in the earth. And that's where they were lowered him before he went the next day to die on the cross for our sins. It would have been down there. There's, they've obviously have got to they excavated. They put some stairs and people can go down there. You know, so you can, people can go there now today. You can see the people down there, but th- it wouldn't have been that way. The Gihon, this is the, the valley of uh, the Kidron Valley, the Gihon Springs. This is, goes down to the Hinnon. These are all, this is all argued about the United Nations and this territory. And those are all Arab homes, Palestinians, and it's always a big fight. There's some speculation now and some evidence that the, the tomb of David might actually be found right in that area across the Kidron. And the Jews are paid millions of dollars. They have to get those people out because when the Palestinians find out they actually sell their homes to the Jews, they kill them. They kill their own people because they don't want evidence to be found. That's the retaining wall. I showed you a picture, David's Tower. And you remember what he was doing when he was supposed to be at war? He was up there looking at Bathsheba, right? He shouldn't have been doing that. Well, over in Jordan, and a mom, this is a mom, Jordan. This is where you're at. You, uh, the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, uh, husband died. Where David had him murdered, right? It's right here at this location, and that's the that's part of the. Some of that wall goes back to that period. Here's the pool of Siloam. So back in Jerusalem, and the waters came down, and Jesus heals the blind man. They just found this. You know, the last six years, it's just been discovered. Just like the text says. That's what it would have looked like. So I. Sometimes I start with this first and just because of time and so we can wrap up. When Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Passion Week and he's coming in, he's coming, he's coming in on Aviv the 10th. And if you go read that in Exodus 12, that's when they selected the lamb for the 10th plague is Aviv the 10th, the first month of the year, the lunar month. And he's crucified on the 14th, Passover, the first feast of so it says you pick your lamb, four days later you sacrifice it. He rides in on the 10th of the beef. He's the lamb that's being presented, select, selected for the sacrifice for you and me. And what those wise guys, those, you know, those seminary guys say, hey, tell all your guys to shut up. They're all saying Hosanna and they're throwing these leaves around. It's just, you know, you know we're going to have all the Greenpeace people complaining because, you know, they're wasting all, killing all these green things. Uh, and Jesus says, if, you, if they were to shut up, the rocks would cry out. Right. Well, I take a little twist on that. The rocks are crying out. We're uncovering all these things, and the rocks are telling us stories that the Bible's true. We're finding and we're digging up on these rocks, and the rocks are crying out that you can trust the Word of God. Amen. That you can trust the Word of God. So, do you trust the Word of God? This is our next dig. And this is Shiloh, and this is, they've already uncovered some area down there, 25 meter by 50 meter. There seems to be a pretty old, something go, old going on there. Uh, if you, any of you ever interested in going on a dig, let me know. My 85-year-old mother's going, the, uh, 84-year-old mother, she'll turn 85 there, is going this year. I would never take her on any of the other digs because it was too rugged. You know, we had to hike in, there was no bathrooms and no water, no nothing. Um, this one's got a cafeteria, you can get coffee, you can get cold drinks, sand, whatever you want. Um, and it's a tourist area, and the bus drives are right there. I says, oh, Mom, why don't you come and you can sit around if you want. And um, so I, we got a number of people. I got pastors from Uganda going. And, um, but if, you, you know, if you're ever interested, every year, May, June time frame, we typically go. So the Lord is good. Thank you for letting me come and share. Went a little bit long. Thank you. So, so let's, let's pray here and we'll dismiss. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you we can trust it. We, uh, uh, I don't know, I just get goosebumps when I look and see your design and see what you put. There's so much more for, yet for me to learn. And I just, uh, I love your word and I love you for sending your son at a prescribed time, your mohadim, your appointed time. Uh, to pay the penalty for my sins. Father, we thank you for that. Be with the people as they go tonight. I pray blessings on them. May you bless them tonight and richly this week and all the work that goes on here. In Jesus' name, amen.
I do have a few things. If you're interested, you can come on up and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some of these things. So.